Hello and welcome to Unstress. My name is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. Well, <clears throat> today our guest is an author, a former psychoanalyst, and a thinker, uh, and a vegan, as you will hear. Um, Jeffrey Mason has written 31 books, and uh, I've had the pleasure of catching up with Jeffrey over many conversations uh, in recent times, and I've always been fascinated by that. Uh, we covered so many topics. His history is such an interesting one. It has relevance to our uh, situation that we find ourselves in today, and there are some real pearls in this which I, I'm sure you will, or I hope you will enjoy as well. So I hope you enjoy this conversation I had with Jeffrey Mason. Welcome to the show, Jeffrey. Pleasure to be there, Ron. Jeffrey, you know, we've uh, spoken over coffee. We have a lot to chat about. But one of the things that uh, struck me was that you have such an interesting background and you have authored uh, you 31 books. That's right. That's right. 31 I'd be books. Ashamed of myself. <laughs> I mean, in many ways, this is uh, you know, I, I, I want to talk to you firstly about about your background and and how this all evolved. Uh, I want to touch on a little bit about the process of writing the book, but the, the themes that you've covered over these 31 books. But I wondered if you might just share with our listener a little bit about your background because it, it is a rather interesting one. It's strange. It's a strange background. Yeah. I would say that I've had three completely distinct careers in my life. Um, so I started out, I, I grew up in a very um, India-oriented family, a Jewish family, um, but my parents were very involved with India. We had a resident guru, a man by the name of Paul Brunton, who was famous in the 1940s and 50s for introducing Indian mysticism, Indian spirituality to the West with a series of books. And he wanted me to be his successor. So he lived with us for many years. And I grew up in that atmosphere and I really accepted it until I went off to Harvard. But even there, I was studying Sanskrit because that's what the guru wanted me to study. And then I suddenly woke up and said, wait a minute, this is not me. I don't believe any of this. Some of it's charming. Some of it is um, uh, pleasant, but a lot of it's insane. <laughs> it, was, it was a kind, I'll tell you what it was. It was a, a, a positive conspiracy theory. He believed that he came from another planet. He believed that he came from Venus. And evidently he sincerely believed that Paul Brunton uh, because I remember one saying to him, PB, why is it you don't drive a car? And he looked at me and had a mysterious smile and said, Jeffrey, on Venus, there are no cars. And I said, wow, you know, I was like 10 years old. Wow, this man comes from Venus. And of course, the irony is now we know there may be life on Venus. So he may be smiling up there down at me. Ha ha, I got the last word. In any event, I did go off to Harvard. I did study Sanskrit. I got a BA in Sanskrit from Harvard. When you have a BA in something like Sanskrit, the only thing you can do is get a PhD in Sanskrit. So I got a PhD from Harvard in Sanskrit. And when you have a PhD in Sanskrit, the only thing you can do is teach it. So I wound up at the University of Toronto teaching Sanskrit. And I had a negative epiphany, standing at the chalkboard, telling my students, I'm going to now write up the Sanskrit alphabet. It's going to take you a couple of weeks to learn it. Don't worry, you'll eventually get it. And they looked at me, all four of them, and they said, hey, wait a minute, we want to fly to other planets. We're not interested in the Sanskrit alphabet. And I thought to myself, you know what, Mason, you made a terrible mistake. This is not you. So I decided then I wanted to change careers. And I had this job. By then I had tenure. And pretty soon I was a full professor of Sanskrit. The University of Toronto could not be fired so I could do anything I wanted. I was teaching very little, by the way. I think at the end I was teaching three hours a week. What a job. It's terrible. Disgusting. But So I thought, well, what do you want? You're fascinated by people's inner lives. So you should become a psychoanalyst. And of course. and of course, the natural yeah. progression, the, the natural, natural right. progression. 
And it just so happened that I had a friend who was a professor of philosophy at the university, about 10 years older than me, and he was a psychoanalyst. And he said, Jeff, this is one of the few places in the world where you can train without being a medical doctor. Normally, you have to be a medical doctor, then you have to become a psychiatrist, and then you can do your 10-year analytic training. But in Toronto, if you had a PhD in an allied subject, you could apply. Now, why they thought Sanskrit was allied to psychoanalysis, I don't know. I guess they didn't know what it was. But in the end, first you have to do a year of analysis yourself. The analyst has to decide whether you're material or becoming an analyst. And after a year, you can apply. I did apply. I was accepted. And I began a 10-year training in clinical psychoanalysis. Now, it's a long story and I'm not going to tell it. And it's, it's been told by many people, <laughs> especially by me. There's also a very mean-spirited book by the journalist Janet Malcolm from The New Yorker who wrote up my story. Um, and that led to a lawsuit which, believe it or not, went to the United States Supreme Court Oh. where I won, the nine justices voted in my favor, but it still had to go back to the federal court in San Francisco and I lost the lawsuit. That's another story. Hmm. But while I was becoming a psychoanalyst, what happened was I was taught, as everyone was at the time, that women will come to you and tell you that they've been sexually abused. They have not been sexually abused, said my teachers. They are suffering from what we call hysterical mendacity. That is, they are telling themselves lies because they want to cover up their own sexual feelings as children. Mm. And I said to them at the time, that makes no sense to me. If a woman, a grown woman comes to my house, sits on my couch and tells me, look, I was abused when I was 12 or 13 by my brother, my father, a neighbor, a friend, whatever, I don't immediately think, oh, that's not true. Mm. But at that time in the 70s, now we're talking, I started my training in 1970, ended in 1979. That was the prevailing view among psychiatrists, psychologists, and psychoanalysts. Mm. So what they said to me is the reason you don't know this is because you haven't had the appropriate training. And one day you'll understand. Well, I never did understand, hmm. and I made it my mission to investigate this more deeply. And as fate would have it, I met Anna Freud, Freud's daughter. And um, to make a very long story short, she became friendly with me because I like dogs and she liked dogs. Mm -hmm. And she told me, go learn German, go to Germany, go to Austria, learn German, come back, and I'll talk to you about allowing you to see the letters that have never been published about child abuse. Mm -hmm. And I did. You know. And that became a book called The Assault on Truth, Freud's Suppression of the Seduction Theory. And for that, I was fired. I was, I was then uh, about to become director of the Freud archives. I'd given up my full professorship. I was to move into Anna Freud's house. I was to take over the archives and all hell broke loose when I first announced that Freud was wrong, these women were not making it up, it's true. Mm. There are letters to show it. We have been handed a false history. And you cannot imagine, this was in 1981, you cannot imagine how that reverberated through the world of psychoanalysis. Mm. Uh, but in any event, I was fired. I lost my position, I was no longer at the university. Uh, I could no longer be a uh, director of the Freud archives. I could no longer be a director of the Freud copyright. I could no longer call myself a psychoanalyst. Um, and in a way, Ron, that was freeing. It freed me up to do what I really wanted to do. So at the time I was living with the great law professor, Catherine McKinnon from Harvard and Michigan on a ranch in a very obscure place in California. And she said to me, darling, <laughs> you now have the opportunity to think about what you really care for, and apart from me. And what I cared for were animals. So she said, why don't you write about the inner life of animals? That's what you talk about. That's what fascinates you. So I did. I wrote a book called When Elephants Weep, 
um, the emotional lives of animals, and it became a gigantic bestseller. It sold one million copies, um, but that was luck. And that, that's another, sometime you and I will talk about that. We story. will, we will, we will. I'm very lucky. Yep. And um, that turned me into a vegetarian. And then my publisher said, write anything you want now. So I wrote my second book called Dogs Never Lie About Love. And that too sold a million copies, became a gigantic bestseller. And I said, you can do no wrong. You can write anything. I said, okay, I'll write about farm animals and their emotions. Uh-oh, it went south, as they say in the training, in the trade. It didn't sell at all. Right. By the way, it's had a kind of resurgence now because people are more, much more interested in plant-based health. Hmm. But at the time, it sold zero copies. And every book I wrote subsequently did not sell. But I didn't care. I was able to write what I wanted. Yeah. Um, I was living eventually with Lila, um, my, my beloved wife, who's a pediatrician. We've now been together 26 years. We have two growing children. I have never been happier in my life. And I think my, my fourth career is going to be, don't do anything, Mason. Just support Lila. <laughs> I am, I am doing that in every way I can. I'm, I was a receptionist, but right now she's only doing telehealth, so I don't have much to do. Yeah, yeah. well, may you continue to do that for many years. And Lila, of course, we had a great interview with Lila um, about a year or so ago, and we're going to revisit that again. But, gee, Jeffrey, now let me just unpack this a little bit because uh, there's so much there. And as you were talking, there were questions I wanted to ask and I, and I want to come back to the beginning because you mentioned Sanskrit. And yes, as a 10-year-old, you were impressed by somebody not having to drive a car on Venus. But your parents were not 10 years old. Right. And, and they were attracted to this message. Firstly, before we go into that in itself, remind our listener about the... Give us Sanskrit 101. Well, this is the language of ancient Indian scriptures. Mm -hmm. So it's um, an Indo-Aryan language. So it's related to our languages. It's not that difficult. It is difficult. Um, it's, it's not an easy language. It's like learning Finnish. Um, and I, I would say for the first four years, I wasn't very good at it, but I eventually got very good at it. I spent time in India and I worked with traditional pundits. So I was studying in Pune, and that's where the university is. And there were a lot of traditional pundits from South India. So they didn't speak English. They didn't even speak Hindi. They spoke Sanskrit <laughs> amongst, with, with people that could do it. Mostly they were silent because they couldn't, some of them didn't speak Hindi, they didn't speak English. What were they doing? They were just scholars. They would do their research. But when they started teaching me, the one in particular was a very great man Srinivasa Shastri, and he liked me, took a real liking to me. And he said, you and I are going to converse in Sanskrit. It's an mm -hmm. ancient language in a sense. It's a dead language, but not for me. He spoke beautiful Sanskrit. And so he taught me to speak Sanskrit. And I think the reason was he wanted to ask me questions that he wouldn't dare ask in any other language. So he was what is known as a brahmacharya. That is, he was in his 40s or 50s at the time, and he had never touched a woman. And he would say to me in Sanskrit, what's it like? Tell me what it's like to be with a woman. <laughs> Which he could never, never admit to doing that. And in Sanskrit, we would talk about this, but we would talk about everything. He was a great scholar. And we would be on the bus together going to the university, and people would look in awe. They'd practically fall at his feet because we were speaking Sanskrit, the sacred Indian language. It has a huge literature. So they write about mathematics, they write about spirituality, they write about poetics, they write history. The Kama Sutra is written in Sanskrit. Uh, almost all the yogic texts, the, 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 the Patanjali's Yoga Sutras are in Sanskrit. So it, it, and it's a magnificent language with a beautiful literature. And I enjoyed doing that, even though, even after I'd left behind my spiritual interests, I was so fascinated with this language hmm. and I became good at it and decided that I wanted to write my PhD on the subject of what is the essence of poetry according to Sanskrit texts. I did that. It was published in the Harvard Oriental series, a 900 page book. 
about the essence of poetry. Uh, I look at it today, I can't understand a word, you know, so much Sanskrit and mm -hmm. 5,000 footnotes and so on, but yeah. But, but I'm intrigued, okay, so, so and I know these, this, uh, these writings would go back, well, thousands of years? Thousands, yes, thousands, thousands of, of years. years yes. Thousands of years. And um, I'm intrigued by your Jewish background, 1940s, 1950s, obviously coming out of a shocking uh, war, uh, yes. particularly for Jews. And yet, and here were your parents enthralled, enthralled by, by this philosophy. What, what do you think was it about that that appealed to them? I get the 10 year, I get the 10 year old being impressed, but I'm yes. intrigued by your parents. Well, you know, this is a very um, interesting and deep question, not easy to answer, mm. because it raises, I mean, my father was a lovely man, um, totally uneducated or self-educated, but very intelligent and very skeptical in general. So my question, like yours, is how could he believe a lot of this nonsense? Mm. Uh, and yet he did. And he retained his ability. He was a very successful businessman in the jewelry business. Um, he loved being around Paul Brunton. I must say, Paul Brunton had a wonderful sense of humor. So being around him was fun. And he was always surrounded by strange people. So it was always an entertaining. I remember when we were in Hawaii, the man who played Tarzan, the second one. I'd, I met the first one, Johnny Weissmuller. Uh, I raced him when I was 12. Okay. <laughs> I lost, I'm afraid to say, <laughs> yeah. in the water. But then the... the, the person who played the second Tarzan came to our house and tried to hypnotize me. There was always something going on. So it was very entertaining. Mm. But I did eventually write a book about this and it's called My Father's Guru, mm. A Journey Through Spirituality and Disillusion. Mm. So my parents went along with it through the first half of that book, but they never became disillusioned. So my father helped me with this book. He gave me all the letters that Paul Brunton had written to him and his brother had written to him and how he met him. And I was able to tell the whole story. But Paul Brunton still has a lot of followers and they were very, very upset with my father. And my father said, look, son, I don't agree with you, but you're entitled to your point of view. And it's fascinating. And I'm intrigued by what you've been able to turn up. Um, but I still believe that one day I will be illuminated, as Paul Brunton promised me. So what PB told my father is I had a vision in which I see a man some 45 years of age who has the power to read another person's spirituality by reading their chakra. He looks and he can see the color that's coming out of their head and he knows where they are on the spiritual path. He's becoming increasingly known in European secret cells. It was a kind of conspiracy theory, as I said, but in a positive way. And my father was thrilled. And I remember he keeps saying to PB, PB, where's this vision going? I still haven't gotten it yet. You know, and they would laugh and play and, and, and joke about it. But he was convinced that one day the Kundalini, this serpent power in him, would come up through his different chakras and blossom out into his brain, and he would attain these mystic powers. Hmm. He really wanted that. Well, I don't blame him. I'd like it too, except mm -hmm. that it exists. Yeah. One can only imagine what, would have, what PB could have done with social media. Oh, my God. Yes, he would. You're absolutely right. And most people, unfortunately, especially today, as you and I know, are using it for the wrong purpose. He, he was benign. You know, he was, I have to say, at the very end of the book, I think I remember saying, I don't even regret having been um, his, his friend or whatever you want to call it for those many years because he was benign. He was not after money. He was not after power. Um, he was not a vicious person. There definitely was no sexuality involved. Um, he was a gentle vegetarian, he was a very tiny man. He wasn't even five feet tall. And he had a wonderful way of speaking. And he did, after all, introduce the West to India. So he was the first person to write about Ramana Maharshi, who was, I believe, even now, a great spiritual person, even though I don't 
agree with him, he, he really had something to say and was an amazing person. And like PB himself, was not interested in fame or money uh, or sexuality or power over other people. Mm. And he was the first to introduce that notion into the West. And he wrote about 13 books, A Search and Secret India, uh, The Hidden Power Beyond Yoga, The Wisdom of the Overself, The Secret Path, all these books, which are very, very popular bestsellers in the 50s. Mm. I mean, uh, how wonderful, actually, irrespective of whether you believe it or not, to be exposed to a vision uh, uh, that yeah. is outside of the Western kind of model of, you know, uh, a, a, the way we are exposed to things. But then you move on to psychoanalysis. And it's interesting that, you know, your uh, uncovering, if you like, of the, uh, the, the truth of child abuse. And yet this was so institutionalised. I mean, you know, this is something we're, we're exposed to just recently in the Royal Commission on Child Abuse and yeah. uncovering that it is so endemic through not just various religious organisations, but within homes. Yes. This is a very real thing. And yet you were almost, dare we, dare we use the term crucified, to, because of your kind of questioning of this. Yes, yes, yes. Good point. I mean, I, I haven't read that report, but I've certainly seen mm. the reports about the report. And it's wonderful. Mm. It, it's magnificent. And uh, I just had the unpleasant experiences. I'm sure you did early this morning of reading that George Pell is on his way to the Vatican. Mm. That man should not be welcome in the Vatican. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I believe he did it. But whether he did it or not, he certainly covered it up. Yeah. For others. Yes. And now we know that. I mean, nobody would say, oh, these children who are talking about what happened in the, in the Catholic Church, they're just imagining it. Nobody says that. Mm. But when I was um, doing my training, everybody said that. There was no such thing. There were very, very, very few people who believed that sexual abuse of children was real. Yes. So, and I mean, Freud, I, okay. Freud, you can't even, you know, that's like the, the god of psychoanalysis. I'm sorry? I, I mean, Freud is, yes. was then, and to some still considered now, but was then uh, the god of psychoanalysis. Well, absolutely. And if he said it didn't happen, mm. it didn't happen. Mm. Um, but what I was able to show is he didn't really believe that. So for me, still, even today, I'd have to say the most exciting intellectual moment of my life was when Anna Freud sat me down at her father's desk and say, go through the drawers, look at whatever you want. At that mm. time, wow. very close to me. She liked me. She trusted me. And I remember I opened the right hand drawer and there were a stack of letters, maybe 50 letters, unpublished letters. And they were all about the sexual abuse of children. Wow. And I said to Anna Freud, what's this? He said, I have no idea. And I began, they were all in German. I began going through them. And it was clear that Freud had a bad conscience about having told the world that it didn't exist. He was preoccupied. And I said to his daughter, well, he must have been preoccupied with this to the end of his days. And she, why would you say that? Because all these letters are right here in his personal desk in the front right-hand drawer. How do you explain that? And she said, I have no idea. And I said, well, I have lots of ideas <laughs> about that. And that kind of became the center of that book, um, The Assault on Truth. Hmm. Because <clears throat> to, go, to go to that point, I mean, as, as I listen to you, I can only think of two reasons why he wouldn't expose that to the general public. And the one is, uh, is that he was uh, a perpetrator of that himself. And it was a truth that was just too, he was not going to expose that, number one alternative. The second alternative, which I think actually has relevance to a lot of health issues and advice today, is that he built his entire reputation on this premise. And this guy was not for turning, to use a terrible quote from a politician I generally don't like, um, you know, when Margaret Thatcher said, this woman's not for turning. Yeah. I, I sadly think that this is something that is endemic in so much health advice we get today. Which of those two things do you think, given everything? Uh, very, very, very well said. 
uh, your second point. Your first point is wrong. <laughs> it's not that. I'm pleased to hear it. I'm pleased yeah. to hear it. No, no. I, I'm also pleased to believe yeah. that. I, I absolutely believe Freud yeah. did not abuse anyone. Yes. He was abused. That's for sure. Um, he was sexually abused? He was sexually abused by a nurse. He says so. Right. Yeah, okay. No, okay. What I don't think he realized is that when that happens to you, one of two things can happen. You either become a crusader to make sure people know this, or you repress it and deny it and don't ever want to hear about it. Yeah. He, ne he needed a good psychotherapist. He really. certainly did, yes. <laughs> yeah. So you're second, and I thought you put that very well. I think that's exactly what happened. And it happens in many, many professions. But, but it's, it's worse when it happens in the health professions because then you're not, and we see it happening right as we're speaking in the United States where you have the president of the most powerful country in the world, denying the reality of both climate change and COVID. It, and, and it's costing lives, as did what Freud did. So this was not a trivial issue. And what the analyst said to me at the time was, look, we're getting these calls. When it broke, the news broke, and it was in the New York Times, uh, two-part article, about what I was finding, all these letters, and people would call and they said, look, Jeff, this is terrible. We have patients coming in complaining and saying, look, I told you I was abused. You told me it didn't happen. Are you aware of the mischief you're doing? I said, but what if it's not mischief, but it's the truth. We've got to face it. At the time, I was naive enough to believe that analysts would say, well, we didn't realize this. That's interesting. I guess we've been on the wrong trail. Let's make amends. But they didn't do that. They shot the messenger. That was me. And they really did. I mean, they did a number on me. They not only took away everything I had at the time, uh, but they vilified me in the press. They, Janet Malcolm wrote this vicious book about me called In the Freud Archives, in which she made up quotations uh, and that's what went to the Supreme Court. Hmm. Are you allowed to make up quotations? Supreme Court said, no, you're not. So she lost that heart, part of it, but she won the second part. But in it, I mean, she was a true believer. And her father was a psychiatrist who believed in Freud. She didn't want some young upstart coming along and say, no, no, wait a minute. You've been wrong on a very crucial point. Now, I believe naively, as I said, that psychoanalysis could continue but they'd have to change that. I don't think now, I think they were right and I was wrong that it was kind of the underpinning because Freud then developed the notion of an Oedipus complex. Uh, and if you took away that and he thought he'd understood um, the importance of childhood fantasies of sexuality, well, if you took that away and you took away that he didn't really understand male sexuality because it was mostly men who were abusing children. So he didn't realize what was happening to men's sexuality. He didn't realize what was happening to female sexuality because they were being abused or to children uh, or to fantasy. There's not all that much left. On the other hand, I was perfectly prepared to say, and in fact, many years later, I did um, published the uh, Freud's interpretation of dreams in a new edition with my annotations and beautiful paintings from many centuries. And, and which I said, look, Freud was a genius. He wrote beautifully. He had a lot of very good ideas and a lot of very bad ideas like most people. And we should be able to take the good and leave the bad. He was wrong about sexuality, wrong about children, wrong about fantasy, but he's right about dreams. He, I think he's correct to say there is an unconscious. He was the first person to use the, the concept of denial, which I think is still very relevant today, even for COVID and for climate change and so many things that we visit today. So I was not willing to um, completely jettison everything that Freud taught us. But because it was a guild and because it was a kind of sect or almost a religion, if I wouldn't go along with it, then I couldn't be part of it. And, the, and, and I had to be vilified too. Mm -hmm, I had mm -hmm. to become, at one point they said, you're the antichrist in the church of psychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. 
well, you know, I don't believe in churches. I mean, it's, <clears throat> it speaks to a more fundamental issue too, I think, that we love certainty. I mean, as yes. humans, we love certainty. And if that certainty can come in a simple explanation, it's even more appealing. Um, I, ca I guess the challenge for us as humans is that actually the world doesn't actually work that way. But, but on the other hand, it's appealing. I mean, one could argue that's part of what makes religion so appealing as well. Yes. Well, and even medicine. Look, traditional training in medicine, not that I'm qualified to speak about it, but I live with a, a medical doctor, so I, I see a lot of it. They too, they like to believe, you know, this is what you're taught. This is the truth. Don't question it. Don't dig deeper and don't go against the grain of established medicine or you will get yourself in trouble. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't talk about all kinds of things that you have opinions on, which mm. is wrong, mm. obviously. But then Jeffrey, <clears throat> so many of the books you've written have been focused on animals. Yes. You know, what's been the, what, what have you, you know, you've talked about a pig on a plate and lost companions and secret of farm animals. <coughs> Excuse me. What? I, I like that title, Pig on a Plate. That's not it. It was called The Face on Your the fa Plate. The Face but on Your Plate. I your... prefer Pig on a Plate. Thank you, the, Ron. The Face <laughs> on Your Plate. I'm sorry. If I, I could reissue it, I would call it Pig it on a be, Plate. Could be the next, it could be the next edition. <laughs> but, but, you know, the cat who came in from the coal, the elephant of, what was that? Fatherhood. Oh, the evolution of fatherhood. The pig who sang to the moon. I mean, what's what's happening here? What have you what have you bringing to this? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, Ron. You ask the best questions. <laughs> um, at first, I believe that what what intrigued me. Well, first of all, I was coming back to my origins. I began as a vegetarian. I wanted to find out: is it okay to eat animals? Because before I wrote that book, I was I'd given up vegetarianism at, at Harvard. Um, and I was eating meat and fish and uh, animal products. And then I began to think about it in a, in a deeper way. And I thought, well, I wonder if it's okay. And I thought, well, well, that's why I'll write this book, When Elephants Weep, because my idea was if animals have the same emotions that we do, is it okay to slaughter them and eat them just because we can or just because we want to. And the conclusion I came to in that book is they do have feelings every bit as profound as our own. And therefore, no, we don't have the right to kill them and eat them. We really don't. Uh, and so I became a vegetarian after I wrote that book. And then I went further because I began to think, well, what about dairy. It come, you know, our, did we evolve really as a species to drink the milk of a different species? There's no animal on the planet that drinks the milk. Well, I think there's some ants that do that. But no mammal drinks the milk of another mammal, just humans. And is that healthy for us? And is it morally right? What are the ethics behind that? And that's what led me to look at the emotions of farm animals. And I decided that no, it's wrong. They have to suffer for us to take their eggs or their milk. And if people knew the amount of suffering and the degree of suffering that was involved, they wouldn't do it. You know, there's this little thing circulating on the internet. I think it originated in Israel, but it probably, I mean, it's everywhere now. This very hip, young, attractive couple <laughs> say that they only eat the freshest food, um, organic, fresh, and they walk into the butcher shop and they tell the butcher, if you've got anything very fresh, and he hands them, no, no, we want very fresh. He said, oh, I have just the thing for you. And he calls his assistant. And of course, as you can imagine what happens, he brings out a baby lamb. This is fresh. And now the couple are horrified, but that's the truth. Mm. You know, when, when you go into a restaurant, you say, I'd like to eat a baby lamb. Mm. You are eating an animal who hasn't had much of a life. You have to face that. And if somebody can say, I don't care, I don't care how much that animal suffered because I like the taste and it doesn't matter to me, I would have no argument with them. But very few people will tell that to mm. you. Mm. They all say, I don't want animals to suffer, right? Yeah. But you mentioned, you know, we haven't evolved to drink the milk of another, of another animal, yeah. but we have evolved with animals. 
We have evolved with animals, but have we evolved to eat them? Okay, I'm prepared to say that a hunter-gatherer society, and we, we have those here, we have, we're able to see that up close in Australia, um, we can see that there probably were no vegans 100,000 years ago, 50,000 years ago. And, and probably until very recently, there were no such things as vegan. However, I have been impressed in, in meeting various um, elders from Aboriginal community that for them taking the life, say, of a kangaroo is a very serious matter. Yeah. It's not something they engage. They don't hunt for the sheer pleasure of hunting. The way, you know, you see these idiots, uh, Trump yeah. sons who go off to Africa and shoot some beautiful animal because they can, not because they want to eat it, but because they want to hurt it. So in any traditional society, it's a very serious matter. And the animal is often a totem animal. They're often part of their lives. They ask forgiveness before they do that. And I can understand that. And of course, they had no choice. Remember, we didn't have alternatives even to milk. Not that we needed it. We didn't really need it. But now everybody has, you can go into Kohl's and get Beyond Burgers, which are delicious. You can't tell whether they're meat or not meat. They're not meat. And soy milk and oat milk and rice milk and coconut milk. And we have so many almond milk. We have so many alternatives. And my question is always, if you can have this and not harm another living being, why wouldn't you do that? Now, something I wanted to say that I, I rarely get a chance to talk about, but you asked, and you're so smart that you'll get this. I also believe that animals, unlike humans, do not have an unconscious. So I admire Freud for having, quote, discovered the unconscious and elevated its importance in our life. And I do believe he was right about that. I believe he had one beautiful phrase, which I'll always admire him for. He said, a man, and you'll like this one, a man can be in love with a woman for many years and not know it until many years later. So even, even love, we can hide from ourselves. No. But an animal can't do that. Mm. No, and, and that was what got to me about dogs. I thought, you know, what dogs feel is so much on the surface. Usually it's just love. You know, they're not pretending that they love it. Cats are a different story, but dogs, you know, they're with you. They don't pretend they love you. They don't have the ability ability to feel unconscious love. They just love. And that fascinated me and it made me wonder, and I've never been able to write about it because I don't have an answer, why did humans develop an unconscious? Mm -hmm. And no other animal does. When an animal feels, it expresses. It doesn't try and hide it from itself or from others. So there is that un, 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 unanswered question. Why are we the only species that can engage in denial? Yes, well, we're, we're, we sort of certainly have a unique ability to communicate with each other, which is yes. very different from all other animals. Although, although, interestingly, I think for the first, well, they say now we've been around for 300,000 years as a homo sapiens species, and it's only since we started writing and sharing our knowledge from one generation to another that we've been able to really build exponentially. And, and deceive. <laughs> and, and? Deceive. Deceive, which, which maybe is where the consciousness yes. comes from. It would, it would be yeah. interesting to do a psychoanalysis of, uh, of a human uh, 10, 15, 20,000 years ago, wouldn't well, it? Well, exactly. You know, what I'm asking, I have not gotten an answer. Maybe if, if, you, if enough people hear this, someone will say, Jeff, I can answer that question. I want to know whether Aboriginal communities had a word, not have it now, but originally before anybody came to this country from the West, whether they had words for war, for enemy, and for torture. I'll bet you, this is just mm. a theory. My theory is they did not. Mm. They mm. did not even have that concept that hunter-gatherers did not have a notion, this person is my enemy, 
um, I hate this person. I want to go to war against that tribe. Uh, I'll torture them if I ever catch them. I don't think they had those words. Yeah. I mean, I think we have so much to learn from our Indigenous yes. uh, people because, uh, you know, God, they've lived here for, well, depends on the studies, again, 60, 70, 80,000 yeah. years, uh, 250 or maybe more nations, I don't know how. I mean, if we were around as a society in 10, 5,000 years to 1,000 years, you know, the way we're going, I'd be really surprised. Um, I think we have just so much to learn about. Their, and their dream time, you know, their sort of way of explaining the world yes. uh, w would have really dug into the unconscious, I think. Would not. I must have. Yeah. Well, I believe they probably didn't have a necessity to deceive others or to deny what was happening. And that's why they know about fire. They know how to use it. Mm. They know what to eat. They know that there are literally thousands of plants you can eat. They knew what to avoid. And it behooves us as a species to go to them and say, teach us. Mm -hmm. you now, Jeffrey, tell me, given all your uh, journey through life, which is fascinating and it's, and it's been interesting to, to, to go through that, how are you seeing what's happening now? What's your, what's your observations of, of what's happening now as we face this pandemic globally? Well, I believe, and I could be wrong, but I believe it does have something to do with, and I think there's some evidence for this, and I'm certainly not alone. I'm not telling you this is the first person to say it. I think this has a great deal to do with the way we've been treating Earth, the way we've treated the planet, the way we've been treating our fellow beings on this planet. I don't think we would have most of these pandemics that we've been exposed to if we did not harm other creatures. I mean, I don't know about you, I'm sure you've seen it too, but some of these pictures of the so-called wet markets in China and other places are absolutely horrifying. When you see the amount of suffering going on, snakes and rats and rabbits and every imaginable creature just skinned alive and lying there, some of them not even completely dead, of course we're going to expose ourselves to pathogens if that's what we do. So we, we need to stop that. And even China's recognized, at least momentarily said, we will not allow these markets. You cannot uh, eat these kinds of animals anymore. I think in the next 100 years, if we survive, I agree with you, or 200 or 300, we will stop this kind of behavior. We will stop treating the earth as if it was there to trample upon. We will stop killing animals. Uh, we will eat a healthier diet. And you know, it's not that difficult, Ron. And uh, many people I know today who become vegan uh, are plant-based because of their health. And I think that makes sense to me. And I, I do hear a lot about it. I read a lot about it. I think the vast majority of people who go that way do it. Um, many of us, I did it exclusively because I did not want to be complicit in the suffering of another living creature. I think there are a, a number of people who believe that. And there are even more today who say, I don't want to harm the earth. And as long as we're eating meat, we're, we're, we're hurting the earth because we're planting these gigantic plantations of soybeans, not to make tofu, but to feed cows who we then slaughter and eat and harm ourselves. It doesn't make sense. And I think that we're in for a major major change in the next 10 years. Around. Mm. Jeffrey, you know, I, I, I mean, our program, uh, this program has focused a lot on regenerative agriculture. And, uh, you know, I think uh, when I, uh, now I don't, when I hear vegans talking, as I know you are, um, one of the questions, two of the questions that I have, I'll just pose a couple of them to you. I think I've already posed one, but here's one. Is there a culture in human history, which has evolved and thrived generation after generation on a vegan diet? No. No. Okay. Okay, that's a good answer. Second, <laughs> second answer, <laughs> second answer is, uh, you know, we have over 
millions of years. I mean, even before Homo sapiens walked on the savannas of Africa, we have evolved over millions of years to have a sacred relationship with animals. That, that is true. I mean, I think, you know, you mentioned that when an, when an indigenous Aboriginal person killed an ab, uh, a kangaroo, it was not done frivolously or, or that. It was done with uh, treating the animal as sacred. So if one, one could argue, and I've heard this said of regenerative farms that, that tend to animals, that they only have one bad day in their life, and that's the day they die. And then we should honour that animal by eating it nose to tail. So we've had a relationship with animals for millions of years. I know that's become perverse. I totally agree with you on that. But the other thing that I I also know is that soil, and I'm about to give a a talk into China in a conference in China in November about soil and health, and we are losing soil hugely through agriculture, through our agricultural practices of both vegetables and animals we are losing <coughs> soils at the rate of inches and it and according to the science it takes 500 years to grow an inch of soil but if you manage animals properly in a regenerative space you can grow an inch of soil in three to five years so is there a difference between well, the I ethic, mean, is it's the ethics? Big, it's a big, big topic, and I'm. It's okay. I'm a, I couldn't uh, let it go, Jeffrey. I couldn't let it go. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. It's 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 well worth asking. First, let me just say on the on the second one, there is a movement now in, and I love this regenerative agriculture, and there is a movement of doing it without animals, so using plants. Yes. Um, and and that's equally successful. Yes. Uh, the, the main point which you of course make is we must do a new form of farming i totally agree with that yes and there's a lot of research being done about how that should be done i sincerely believe it can be done without animals and it should be done but i totally agree with you there's a big difference between allowing an animal its full life and having quote one bad day on the other hand i mean it's an old idea and i well, i remember when i first came across it and it bothered me because it makes so much sense. And yet, you know, if, if somebody said, your son is now at the University of Melbourne, he's going to have the best time there for four years. And our son is at the University of Melbourne <laughs> in Orman College and doing so well. And he's going to have 365 days times four And at the end of that, he's going to have one bad day and we're going to use his body to get his brilliant brain somewhere and his eyes for someone else. Wait a minute. You're not going to do that to my son. I do not want him to have a single bad day. And I think, you know, we don't really have the right to take life if we don't have to. Hmm. I understand... um, 20,000 years ago, we had no choice. And, you know, I totally agree with you. There is no historical record of any vegan society. But I think there will be in the future. Um, You know, we didn't, I mean, there are all kinds of things that we we didn't have before that we now have now. There are also certain kinds of knowledge we didn't have. And there's some knowledge we did have. I'm sure that Aboriginal communities knew that kangaroos had an emotional life, that they had an inner life and that they respected that. Yes. We lost that for a long time. Yep, we still... And it's, all, it's only now coming back. Mm-hmm. So then we'd have to face the fact, okay, if a kangaroo has an inner life and they care about their young and they have these little joeys and they take care of them and they love them and they love one another and they... They're in mobs and, and, and they do no harm to the environment. They drink very little. Do we have the right ever to kill even one of them when we don't have to? Now that, you know, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to talk to an Aboriginal elder who says yes. And of course they may have had to, they didn't have access to Beyond Burger. 
they didn't have access to soy milk and all of these other things. Of course, they didn't drink milk. I don't think Aboriginals drank milk until fairly recently. It was so, hard to it was hard to uh, milk a kangaroo. Uh, you know, that's you, right. That that's would have been right. a challenge. Well, yeah, and it would be very hard to uh, milk a wild cow. Mm, they mm. would kill you. Yep, yep. You know. So it's only when we kind of cheat. But I mean, these are open questions. I, I agree with yep. you that these can be talked about. Yes. I, I don't want to be dogged. And they're, and they're important questions too. And they're important questions. They are. Now listen, just finishing up, because we're coming to the end, it's been a fascinating conversation we've just had, but we're all on this health journey together through life in this modern world. And uh, I wondered if you might share with us what you thought was the biggest challenge for an individual on that journey. I mean, yeah, what do you think the biggest challenge is? Well, I think the biggest challenge is to recognise that we have been brought up not to question what has been around us, to not question the way we've been brought up. So people will say, why would I go for organic? Uh, you know, it was perfectly okay for my parents to eat whatever was around. And I was brought up to eat this, that, and the other. Uh, what do you mean a supplement? I mean, we didn't have supplements 50 years ago. And I say, well, you have to be willing to question things. You have to be willing to think about things. You have to be willing to talk to people who know more about this than you do. You have to be willing to do the research. Um, it, it, it takes time and it takes energy, but it's worth doing. And if you just accept everything because you were taught that as a young person, that's wrong. <laughs> you have to be willing to question everything. And many of the things we were taught are right, but much of what we were taught was wrong. And we have to be willing to sort that out. So men need to have, especially men need to have conversations about health issues, you know, and especially as we age, Ron, you know, and I'm further along than anybody I know right now, alas, I'm about to turn 80. I realize there are all kinds of things I need to talk to other men about. So what did you do? And it's hard for us because we're not used to it. And often I'll say things and men will say, gee, that's an awfully personal question. And I say, yeah, but I'm asking not out of mere curiosity. I want to be able to exchange information. I learned something. You learned something. Let's share it. So I, I, I think the most important thing I've learned is to keep a skeptical mind but keep an open mind and, and try and find the best sources you can. You have to be able to trust, especially in today's world where so much information is available, but so much of it is not useful information. Q QAnon, you know, these crazy kind of conspiracy theories, you know, use your head. Think about that. Don't just take it in. So be skeptical, but be open. Well, Jeffrey, what a note to finish on. And thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. Well, Ron, I have to say you ask the most intelligent questions. <laughs> thank you. I mean that. <laughs> a pleasure. Bye now. Thanks, Jeffrey. So there it is. I mean, interesting to follow that history, isn't it? Uh, a family that is... Um, absorbed by a visionary uh, in the 40s and 50s. And as a 10-year-old boy, his, uh, his experience with that. Um, but, but what attracted his parents to it? Uh, the, uh, his journey through psychoanalysis and uh, actually questioning the norm of Sigmund Freud and where that ended up and why Sigmund Freud would actually resist what he had hidden in his drawer and yet build a whole psychoanalysis. I think the relevance of that is just so important. So much of our health knowledge today is built on reputation. And it's very hard to turn that ship around once you have people that are in positions of power that are formulating public health policy, even if uh, like Freud, received letters which showed that he was actually wrong. There was no way that Freud was going to allow that to happen. And that is happening today. That is still happening today. And we've covered some of those issues, and I've covered some of those in, in that episode, The Elephant in the Room. And uh, what a prolific author. Gee, I mean, I've only written one book, and okay, Jeffrey's got a few years on me, but 
I will definitely be getting together with him for him to be mentoring me through, I hope I can write uh, a few more books. Uh, anyway, I really enjoyed that conversation. I've so enjoyed talking to Jeffrey anyway, and I wanted to share that with you. So um, I hope uh, this finds you well through these challenging times. So until next time, this is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. Be well. This podcast provides general information and discussion about medicine, health, and related subjects. The content is not intended and should not be construed as medical advice or as a substitute for care by a qualified medical practitioner. If you or any other person has a medical concern, he or she should consult with an appropriately qualified medical practitioner. Guests who speak in this podcast express their own opinions, experiences, and conclusions.